one. Today's sermon comes from John 3, 16 and 17. This is the word of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the word of God. Past few Sundays, I have talked about the glory of God. I talked about the grace of God. And last Sunday, I talked about our faith in God. And today, I'm going to speak about the love of God. So this will be more about topical preaching than an expository preaching of looking into the one text and then opening it up. Instead of that, I will go over many Bible scriptures today on this topic of the love of God. And this love of God may be a topic that you are familiar with, something you're very familiar with, including the our passage John 3, 16 and 17. You probably heard this a lot. And then if you go to In-N-Out, under the cup of In-N-Out, John 3, 16, I was like, ooh, that famous verse. So I heard that a lot about God's love, 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 God's love, and, you know, in a church, in song, and so and so. But what is your understanding on God's love? What is your understanding on God's love? Is there, for example, is there a difference between God's love towards non-believers, the world, and believers? Or does he love the same? Are you growing in his love? Are you rejoicing in his love? That you know, you really know his love and you're rejoicing in him. You're confident in him. Or does his love compel you to love one another among the brothers and sisters? Or does his love convict you to share the gospel with other people? John, let me begin with this. John, 1 John 4.8. 1 John 4.8 says, God is love. That's who he is. God is is love. Love, hear me, love is not God, but God is love. I want you to see the difference. Love is not God. Love is not the highest. God is love. In other words, this is his character. This is his attribute. This is who he is. Undeniable character of God. Our God is love as He is holy, as He is wise and good, just, righteous, and so and so. He is love. Love is not something above God, but from all eternity, this is who He is. He is full of love. Always. Wait. Maybe some people ask this question or thinking this question. Wait. If this is God's eternal attribute of character, that he's love, he's full of love, how do we make sense when there was nothing to love? Before the creation of the world, the universe, there was nothing outside of himself. What do you mean that he eternally full of love? Because there's nothing to love. Just him. Nothing exists outside of him. What do you mean he's full of love for all eternity? So I want you to hear this. First, there is love within the Godhead. We call this intra-Trinitarian love. Intra-Trinitarian love. In other words, perfect and eternal love within the Trinity, between the persons of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You look into Matthew, we have seen, gone through the Matthew series together, and when Jesus was baptized and came out of the Jordan River water after the baptism, there was a voice of God speaking from heaven above. Not only that occasion, when Jesus went to the mount with some of his disciples and the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus transformed and shined like the sun, revealed his true glory, there was a voice of God from heaven. So two times in that story, Jesus' life. The God the Father spoke out of heaven. The people were able to hear the voice of God from the heaven speaking. Both times, he said the same thing. This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Both occasions, when God spoke utterly out of heaven, he spoke about his love and pleasure on his son. I love him. 
I'm pleased with him. John 3, 35 says, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. The Father loves the Son, not something, not partial. He gave everything, all things, all things into the hand of the Son. John 5, 20, it says, For the Father loved the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater work than these he will show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raised the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to those whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. What he says here, Jesus says, Father loves the Son so much, he shows everything what the Father does, so that the Son does the same. As the Father rules, the Son rules. As the Father judges, the Son judges. As the Father gives life, the resurrection, the Son gives resurrection to whomever he wills. Father gave all authority, everything, into the Son's hand. And he says in the Bible, the Father redeems us and gave all the redeemed, the believers, to the Son as his pride. Father, withhold nothing from the Son. Everything is your Son out of love. Hear me clearly, church. Yes, God loves you, so he saves you. But the primary love is this. God loves his Son so much that he saved you and gave you to him as his bride. Primary love is the father's love towards the son. That's why he redeemed us and gave us to the son as his bride, as his subject, as his brothers. Here for you, son. John 17. I encourage you one time read John 17. It's a prayer of Jesus. It's a priestly prayer of Jesus. And when you read it, you can get a sneak peek into the intimacy between the Father and the Son. And what conversation they had from all eternity between the Father and Son. And here, John 17, verse 24, this is what Jesus says to the Father. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me. May be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because, why? You loved me before the foundation of the world. Why God saved us and gave us and as Father sent the Son into the world, say, Son, I give them to you. They are yours. Why? Because you loved me for all eternity before the foundation of the world. It was because of the Father's eternal love towards the Son. That's why we are saved, to be given to the Son. John 14, 31, on the other hand, Jesus said, I do, Jesus said, I do, as the Father has commanded me, so that the third world may know that I love the Father. Jesus honors the Father. Jesus glorifies the Father. Jesus obeys the Father. He does everything what Father commands. Though, even though the Son is equal with the Father, He always obeys the Father. Why? Because He loves the Father. To the point of dying on the cross. Why He does that? Because I love my Father. In the same way, I cannot go all in detail due to time. The Father loves the Holy Spirit, honors the Holy Spirit. For example, if you look into Matthew 12, any sin and blasphemy can be forgiven except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven 
either in this age or in the age to come. And you can sense the Father's care and love for, towards the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit loves the Father and the Son. And according to the Gospel of John, the Holy Spirit does not turn our attention to Himself. Always about the Father. Always about the Son. He always tells us about, Father, believe the Son, love the Son, love the Father. Holy Spirit always honor the Father and the Son. He glorifies the Father and the Son. There is this perfect, complete, infinite, eternal love and delight within the Godhead. In among those persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Before anything exists, our God in Himself is full of love. I want you to see this glorious reality. Your God is full of love in himself. God is love. Second, he has love for the world that he has created. His love towards the humanity. He loves the humanity. He loves the world that he created. John 3, 16, the one we read, it says, God so loved the world. Right? That's a famous phrase. What does it mean? How do we make sense? How can we put to get this together when we heard at church in the Bible that God is angry? God's wrath against sinners. God's wrath against this world. So God is angry against sinners in this world. So God will judge and God loves the world. How, how do we put these two together? What, what do you mean he loves the world? When other place says God's angry against the world, against the sinners. God's love is what many people want to hear about, including non-Christians. When people want to hear about the love of God. I think almost no one, no one has a problem with this Christian doctrine that God is love. And often it seems like their understanding of God's love is different. Their pers- expectation on God's love is different from what Scripture teaches. Because for them, they said, they argue, if God is full of love, God is so loving, they, He should not send people to a place like hell. That's horrible. If God is so full of love, how can He do that, sending people to hell? And including me too. I'm, I'm not going to go to church. I'm not going to believe Jesus. But if you say God is so love, come on. Hint, hint. But overlooking sin and evil is not love. Let me explain it this way. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is, there's an even song about this. It's a well-known passage of the Bible, the passage on love. Love is patient, love is kind, love is love, 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 love. What love is? It's a description of love. And verse 6, it says, Love, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing. Romans chapter 12, Paul says, let your love be genuine. What do you mean genuine? Abhor what is evil. So if I hate you and punch you, steal you, that is evil. How can love rejoice or allow this something that is bad and evil? Genuine love, abhor, hates, pulls, rejects what is evil. Our God is perfect in love. Also, he is perfect in holiness and justice. So his attribute, his character of love, does not overpower other attributes. The love is so strong that you overpower holiness or justice. It doesn't do that. And let me put it this way. God is not a prisoner of his love. Oh, love is not something above God. It's like, oh, my God, I cannot do other things. No, he's not a prisoner of his own love. He will punish and judge all sins. It's clear. Either you pay for your sin or you let Christ handle it for you through his death on the cross. It has to be paid. So God is furious in burning anger against sin while that is true. And it still Bible affirms that God so loved the world. 
How can we understand this together? Let me put it down in the three way, one level. Matthew chapter 5. Chapter 5. It says, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Why? Why do we need to love our enemies, those who hate us? Jesus gives a reason, verse 45. So that you may be the son, you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. Because he makes the son, his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Why we Christians should love even our enemies, those who oppose us and hate us. And the reason that Jesus is laying down for us is because of this. Because that's what your father does. Your father loves those who hate him. So you as sons, do the same. Follow after him. What, what do you mean the father loves those who hate him? He gives son on the good, on the evil. He gives rain, just and unjust. We are talking about here material, physical, general provision, goods. That such as health, safety, food, vacation, great weather, medicine. It's not only for those who love God and obey God and follow Him. God only, okay, for you, but now you guys, He doesn't do that. Even the wicked, even the unrepentant sinners in the world, they get the benefit of it. God still provides it to them. God still gives them. God still gives them food. God still. Your father provides even those who hate him. He has love on his created world, on the humanity. So one level, we got to understand his love in the general material provision. We all call it common grace, commonly given to all people. And on the level, second level, his love towards the world is manifest in giving them warnings and time to repent giving them warnings and time to repent. God does not judge or punish the wicked people and done away with them as soon as they sin against God and rebel against God. Boom! I'm done with you. Go. He doesn't do that. He does not give them what they deserve right at the moment when they have done wrong. He loves them enough that he gives them warnings and he gives them opportunity time to repent. For example, when my children do something wrong and I notice that, I don't spank them right away. You do something wrong, I don't, I don't do that right away. It's a lot. I, I, I would like to say, like, I give them warnings. Warn, first warning, don't do it. Second warning, and third, no, normally third time is the time out. Man. But God is much more patient than I am. He gives them warnings and time to repent. God loves them enough to do it. Romans 2, 4, it says, Or do you preserve on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. His kindness, his love, his mercy, his patience is giving them and leading them to repent. Repent. Romans 2.15 says, Paul there says, God wrote his law on the table of our people's heart. Whether they never heard about Jesus, but everyone knows the law of God because it's written on their conscience. They know it is bad. They feel, we say, we feel guilty. When they do something wrong, they sense the guilt which means they sense the need of repentance. They sense that something has, done, has to be done about my wrongdoing, my sin. God gives them warnings to all people and the need of the repentance to all people in their conscience. Third level, what do you mean that God loves the world? God loves the world, the sinful humanity, that it goes beyond not only giving the warning, he offers salvation. He offers salvation. 
Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2. I will not read in detail, but if you read Psalm chapter 2, wonderful passage. Verse 1 through 5, it talks about the nations raised against God, plotting against God. Nations, you know, the world, the world. The world is against God. The world is rebelling against God. They are taking counsel together to go oppose God. And God says in verse 5, God speaks in wrath. If you look at verse 5, it's like you see that God is angry against the world. And there, verse 6, he speaks about his anointed. It's because the world was against God, the Lord, and he's anointed. Anointed in the Hebrew word, Messiah. In the Greek word, in the New Testament language, Christ. So the world is against God and Christ. And about Christ, this is what God says. I have set my king upon my hill. And verse 7, it says, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Do you see the capital S son right there? It's about the son of God. What, what, what do you mean that today I have begotten you? We heard about it. We learned that Jesus was never created. Jesus is co-eternal with the Father in the Trinity. What do you mean that begotten? Clearly, this is referring to his incarnation. Easy way to put it, that the Son of God came into this world. Born as God-man. Born as the Christ. Born as a Messiah. Today I've begotten you. So God sent his son to be born as the king, to be set on his hill. Today I have begotten you, Christ. And then God gives the message to the world. From verse 12, 11, 12, I believe you look into that. It says, serve him with trembling. Kiss the son. You want to leave? You want to be saved? I'll show you. I'll tell you the way you can be saved. Kiss the son. Believe my son. Worship and serve. Kneel before my son. Then you will live. So his wrath and anger against the nation is true. Yet he loves them enough. Instead of just punching them and done away with them, he gives them, this is how you can be saved. I'm giving you my son. Kiss the son. Trust the Son. Come to the Son. That's the way that you can be saved. Ezekiel 33, 11. Brothers and sisters, I want you to see this. Here is what God says. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He takes no delight. When the wicked person, sinner, dies, yay, die, one bad guy dies. He doesn't do that. He takes no pleasure. And he pleads with us, with the sinners, Turn! Why you want to die? Why you want to be perished? Turn, live! I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He loves them enough that he wants him to turn and live. The offer of salvation goes even to those who oppose him and hate him. And that to the point that he gave his eternally beloved son as a way of salvation. I mean, we are talking about amazing love. Who will do that? Which one of you will do, give your son for the one who hit you? That's what John 3.16 is saying, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And pay attention to this. Look into this invitation. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Whoever. Some hyper-Calvinists say, come on, we shouldn't say this to everybody. We cannot say this to everybody. You know, What if they are not chosen by God? What if that person is not elected by God? So, we shouldn't say that. Or other people say, if God 
you know, God's elect and chosen people only, they are saved. And what's the point of evangelism? We shouldn't do evangelism. What's the point of it? Wrong approach, wrong teaching. What it says here in John 3, 16 is, let me say this clear. I hope it, you get it clear. True. This invitation is true. Get this straight. Whoever believes in the Son will not perish but have eternal life. Whoever. This invitation, this offer is true. It is not for you to figure out whether that person is chosen or not. It's hidden in the mind of God. But whoever believes, as for us, whoever believes in Jesus you'll be saved. And all whom God has chosen will just do that exactly. They will believe. They will repent. John 6, 40. Jesus says, for because this for, this is the will of my Father, that everyone, I'm emphasizing the word here, Everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life and I will raise Him up on the last day. Everyone who looks on the Son and believes eternal life, I will raise Him up. Resurrection again. Everyone, whoever, John 3, 16, here, everyone. This offers to all people. As for you, on your part, you got to believe and repent in Jesus. Then, whoever that might be, you will be saved. Verse 17 of John 3. Because for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That's a passage we read. Brothers and sisters, are you with me? He's not bringing the condemnation first. He did not send his son Jesus to judge us and punish us first. No. His love for the world is offering salvation first to the world. Not to condemn the world, but to offer salvation. That is love. So when we say, God loves you to the people in this world, even to the unbelievers. Can we say that to unbelievers? Like, hey, let's say we go to mission. And say, God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. Kids and people, elderly, come. God loves you. If we say that, what do you mean? This. When we say God loves you generally in this world, that's what it means up to this point. It does not mean that God is okay with their sin. It does not mean that God is not angry with their rebellion. It does not mean that God is very happy and pleased with them. It does not mean that. It just means that God has mercy on them. So he provides all that they need. General good. It means God loves them enough that he gives them warnings and time to repent. He loves them enough. He truly offered the salvation through his son, Jesus Christ, to them. That's it. Now, there's a difference when we say to Christians, God loves you. When I look at you, believers say, God loves you. This love, his love for his own, his children, is at a different level. That's my third point. God has a special love for his own, his children. This love is limited in its number on whom, one people whom he set his love on. Yet it is unlimited in its degree, its strength. This love is fueled by his sovereign determination. His attribute, not based on your qualification. Not based on your qualification. God's special love for us Christian is not based on how lovable you are, how beautiful you are, how good you are. It's not. Let me say that again. Based on his sovereign determination. John 13, 1. 
It says, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own. You see, he loved whom? His own. Who were living in this world, in the world. He loved them to the end. To what degree he loved them? To the end. Now, when he says to the end, it does not just mean simply in the time-wise, like the, to the, the final moment in the aspect of time. No, it denotes, it highlights, it implies that he loved them to his fullness, to the maximum capacity. He loved them to the end. Now this, if you look into the context of that story, this was right before that Jesus was arrested. He knew that his disciple will be unfaithful to him. He knew that disciples will deny him, run away from him. He knew that disciple won't be there with him. This disciple did not care about Jesus' suffering, even though Jesus talked about it. Even until that moment, they were fighting among them. Over who is the greatest among them? Over who's going to sit at the right and the left? Who's going to get more power and higher position among us? Totally out of touch, ignorant, selfish, prideful, self righteous, arrogant, weak. The picture we get about this disciple, his own, is very ugly. I'm sorry, that's us. One morning we say, We love you. And a couple hours later, Gone. He loved them to the end, to the maximum capacity, though they are weak, unfaithful, broken. Famous verse, Romans 5 8. It says, God showed his love for us in this that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For us, church, while we were still sinners, not after we fixed everything, not after we qualified, not after we got better, no, while we were still ignorant of His grace, we didn't even know the need of His grace. We didn't even ask for it. We didn't think, oh, I'm pretty good. I'm a good person. I don't need Jesus. While we spoke all kinds of blasphemous things against him. Sorry. You're not that different and not that much better than the world. That was us, isn't it? Yet he loved us at a different degree. He loved us till the end. And John 10 15 says, Jesus, he lays down his life for his ship, his own, his ship, for you. With all our ugliness. I want to go a little further. Church, I hope you stay with me. And those of you are watching at home too. And please pay attention to John 17. I'm just simply going to read it for us. And see how much he loves us. Jesus, once again, John 17 is Jesus' prayer. Conversation between Father and the Son. There Jesus says, I in them, and you, Father, in me. That they may become perfectly one. So that the world may know that you have you sent me. And love them, how much? Even as you have loved me. I want them to know that you love these people, my own, as much as you love me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these Know that you have sent me. He's talking about us, his disciple, his own. Verse 26, I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me, the Father loved the Son, that love may be in them and I in them. 
at the beginning of this sermon, I talked about the great father's love towards his son. That complete, perfect, eternal love the father has for the son. And what we see in the scripture is the father loves you in the same manner, in the same degree. Perfect, complete, eternal love. That, to me, is mind-blowing. That God loves me and takes pleasure and delight in me in the same manner that God does to his own son, Jesus. Not because we are appealing and attractive to God. And our sin, my sin, is plainly displayed before God. But his love, in spite of all this, he loves us knowing that our love will be imperfect. We are talking about love that purifies, love that cleans us, love that restores us, love that renews us, love that carries us, love that blesses us, the love that overcomes all our shortcomings. So complete, so perfect, so strong, so eternal that he speaks in the scripture towards us. I have loved you with everlasting love. Based on what? Before the foundation of the world, he, his determination, sovereign determination. I will love them. See, what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. Church, do you believe? Do you see Father as stingy Father? Or do you believe your Father loves to bless you, loves to protect you, loves to provide you, loves to carry you? He looks at you, despite of all our shortcomings, He takes pleasure, delight in you. Just like he does to his son. This is my beloved son. I am well pleased. Let me end with this. I want throughout this week meditate on his love towards you, church. And I'll give you two other applications here. Right? One, John 15, Jesus says, As the Father loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. He said, abide in my love. How do we do that? If you keep my commandment, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. Meditate on his love. Abide in his love by keeping his word. One more. First John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another. Why? Because love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Church, let us love one another. Despite of the personality difference, uh, we don't really get along that well. Despite of that, despite of cultural difference or language preference, some of us, or different view on other things, different political views we may have, different attitude towards this, how serious we take this COVID, whatever that might be. These are not eternal things. These are not the essential things. He has loved you. And the one who is in this church, believer, God loved the person to this degree. Let us love one another. For love is from God. Let's pray.